This is the second of two videos covering uh, the top ten fallacies of Judaism. This picks up with uh, number six. Isaiah 53 is a story of righteousness. It is not a song, as is taught in Judaism, of the history of the Jewish people. The witnesses of the first six verses of Isaiah 53 are sick with guilt from not following God's law and not being righteous. And they're in quotes. Verse 1 begins with a quote, and that quote ends at the end of verse 6. That combines everybody in those six verses as uh, a similar people, same people. They're sick with guilt, and so, from not being righteous, and the man goes through this fire of refinement with God, God's boot camp, which I mentioned in uh, at the end of the uh, first video of two on the top ten fallacies of Judaism. He goes through this fire of refinement for them. To become God's righteous servant, who makes the many righteous. An example is, he was wounded for our sins. He is, but not in the sense Christians believe in some sort of human sacrifice. He is wounded by God, in the power of God, to make him humble to God and the Jewish people. To take his self-will from him. And to, so that he'll be suitable um, to God for God's purposes as a prophet. To remove, to remove the fury as his spirit. Which we, we saw Ezekiel say, I went in bitterness and the fury of my spirit in the hand of God. And we know Moses had the same kind of temperament. His story pretty much begins with he became so angry at a man that he killed him and getting into fights. And to be presentable, to go to those who are sinning and who are sick from it, sick with guilt in these first six verses. They are the many made righteous. See, it's a story. I mean, he's, he's pretty much like them. But he rises to the crown of, of, of God's righteous servant. Through this fire of refinement. That's how he's prepared. And taught at the same time. Taught the scripture. And bring them to observant Judaism, which removes their guilt. And that's what Isaiah 53 tends about. He offered himself for guilt. Offered myself to go to the fire of refinement. To go to them and remove their guilt. Okay, just because I went through the fire of refinement does not remove their guilt. This is reality. This is the real world. It's because as God's righteous servant, if they recognize me, and that's how the first verse starts. Who can believe our report? Who has the arm of the Lord been revealed on? Okay, that means they recognize me, believe who I am, and once they hear my story, and understand how poorly Judaism has interpreted Isaiah 53, and that God is literally, literally with me. His spirit entered into me, and God is in his spirit. That makes them want, you know, believe again. And, and I come with the covenant of sin forgiveness that is delivered in my capacity as Elijah. And really all I'm telling them is, you're sin free. You can, your guilt's gone. I offer myself for your guilt. And that's what it really means. It, 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 it's almost like, um, well, I was going to say metaphors, but it's not a metaphor. It's just, well, I'll come back to that. That is why he offers himself to God for guilt, emotional guilt. 
of those who are not righteous, that he's going to make righteous because they're going to believe in him and that God is here. God is doing what he said he's going to do and you're sin free. Get back to observant Judaism or come to observant Judaism if you've never been. Honor God. He's cleared your slate. He's made you a holy seed to place his temple amongst you forever. You'll never be defeated and uprooted and dispersed again. The fire of refinement. And and so, you know, I've gone through the fire of refinement. And now I'm going to make the many righteous. Those who believe in me. Based on these proofs, my knowledge, and the two books that God dictated to me as he dictated the Torah to Moses. That's the proof. That my knowledge of heaven as Elijah. Isaiah uh, 53 was written in such a manner that you cannot put it together if you are not going through it. No one ever has. God had it written that way by Isaiah. You can't figure it out. And you don't even realize Ezekiel goes through the same thing. That's the go-by that God put, in, put into the Tanakh to show you this is, this is how it's been done before. These are the same words being used. Ezekiel is punished for what? Well, ultimately for the sins of the houses of Judah and Israel. That's what he's told. Uh, but, but really what's happening is God's just making him angry, making him furious and bitter, being told he's got to suffer their, their, their punishment. <clears throat> it's not really what's going on. God's just preparing him. I have been in God's fire refinement for 13 years. He spoke to me when I was 50 and I'm 63 today. <clears throat> During which he taught me the scripture and how to interpret Isaiah 53 and its association with the day of the Lord. You can find these two books, Isaiah 53 and the day of the Lord at keithmccartymccarty.wordpress.com and the second book, and this book was, was written so you can see how my life fits me into the verses of Isaiah 53. It's called The Life of God's Righteous Servant of Isaiah 53 at the same WordPress site. It's my life. But he dictated it to me. He said, this is what I won't put down. And, and basically, again, it's to show you who I am, but it's also to show you how I fit the verses. And it goes about seven chapters, that are six chapters that are my life, from birth, and then in chapter 7, it's called God Speaks to an Atheist. And then from 7 to 16, you see you see the fire of fire. It's, it's me and God and the Spirit in me, and God's in the Spirit. And so the rest of the book is just uh, the last 13 years. And I am the only man who has ever lived, including Jesus, that fits every verse. God orchestrated my life to be sure of it, to be a man of suffering familiar with disease and affliction and disease, well, crushed with disease. Okay, the day of the Lord. Judaism, this would be... Number seven of the top ten fallacies of Judaism. <clears throat> Judaism teaches that in the Messianic era, the world is perfected and sin removed. Basically, utopia, heaven on earth. In the day of the Lord, he comes not to destroy sinners, remove sin, or require repentance, but to forgive the Jewish people. He comes with the covenant of sin forgiveness. The Jewish people make it, so there will be a holy seed to build the third temple. 
just as he forgave the Assyrian Babylon exiles, making them a holy seed, and they built the second temple. The term day of the Lord appears in the books of Isaiah, Ezekiel, Zechariah, Amos, Abadiah, Zephaniah, and finally, in the last book of the prophets, Malachi. In Ezekiel and Zechariah, the day of the Lord is said to be only against the nations, which would be the Gentiles, nations of the Gentiles, and in Obadiah against Adam and Esau, which, as we've seen previously, Christianity, Adam, and the nations. The prophets warn that the day of the Lord is near, but it is not the end of the world. The wicked and sinners will be punished and justice established. This is Isaiah chapter 13, verse 9. Lo, the day of the Lord is coming with pitiless fury and wrath to make the earth a desolation, to wipe out the sinners upon it. That doesn't sound like going out and perfecting the world by Moshiach to accept the Jews as having always been right about God all along. This is Ezekiel chapter 30, verses 3 through 5. For a day is near, a day of the Lord is near. It will be a day of cloud, an hour of invading nations. A sword shall pierce Egypt, and Nubia shall be seized with trembling. When men fall slain in Egypt, and her wealth is seized, and her foundations are overthrown, Nubia, Put, and Lud, and all the mixed populations, and Cub, and the inhabitants of the allied country shall fall by the sword with them. This is Joel chapter 2, verse 12 through 13. Yet even now, says the Lord, turn back to me with all your hearts, and with fasting, weeping, and lamenting. Rend your hearts rather than in your garments, and turn back to the Lord your God. For he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in kindness, and renouncing punishment. This is Joel chapter 3, verse 5. But everyone who invokes the name of the Lord shall escape, for there shall be a remnant on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, as the Lord promised. Anyone who invokes the Lord will be among them, uh, among the survivors. This is Amos chapter 5, verse 12. For I have noted how many are your crimes and how countless your sins. You enemies of the righteous, you takers of bribes, you who subvert in the gate the cause of the needy, assuredly, at such a time the prudent man keeps silent, for it is an evil time. Seek good and not evil, that you may live, and that the Lord, the God of hosts, may truly be with you as you think. Hate evil and love good, and establish justice in the gate. Perhaps the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. This is Obadiah, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Thus said the Lord God concerning Adam, Christianity. I will make you least among the nations. You shall be most despised. Your arrogant heart has seduced you. You who dwell in clefts of the rock, in your lofty abode, you think in your heart, who can pull me down to earth? Should you rest as high as the eagle? Should your eyrie be lodged among the stars? I will pull you down, declares the Lord. Zephaniah chapter 1, 14 through 18. And I will bring distress upon men, 
that they shall walk like blind men because they have sinned against the Lord and their blood shall be poured out as dust and their flesh as dung. Zechariah uh, chapter 14 verses 12 through 17. And for those peoples that warred against Jerusalem, the Lord will smite them. With this plague, their flesh shall rot away while they stand on their feet. Their eyes shall rot away in their sockets, and their tongues shall rot away in their mouths. Okay, these are examples of rotting for the people of antiquity and the Dark Ages, the Middle Ages. That appears to be prophecy. But in the age of reason and information, we know will never occur. Very entertaining and believed by the masses who could not read and had never been to school in antiquity in the Middle Ages. Good, fearsome stories. They have nothing to do with the day of the Lord in God's final words on the subject for a time to come as announced in Jeremiah 31 of the New Covenant completely changes, has nothing to do with wiping out evil, sinners being destroyed, horrible plagues put on people. And it has nothing to do with perfecting the world. It has to do with sin forgiveness of his people and the building of the third temple. It comes with sin forgiveness. He's not coming to destroy sinners. Completely changes. The earth... And it's his final word. It's the last thing he talks about with the prophets before he stops speaking to the prophets. Malachi 3 brings a new concept to the day of the Lord. It is God's final word on the day that he is preparing where a scroll of remembrance will be written at his behest concerning those who revere the Lord and esteem his name. He does not address the nations, the Gentiles, but only Israel and its people. To them coming back to return to my temple that I'm going to place amongst you eternally. You'll no longer be the taunts of nations. You'll never be defeated and dispersed again. The lamb will bloom. I'll bring the rain. And sin forgiveness. In the day of the Lord, he comes with his messenger, Elijah, and the angel of the new covenant of sin forgiveness, not to destroy sinners or require their repentance, but to forgive them and give them another chance. That would be just to his people. The scroll of remembrance, you have to be entered into it to go to the heaven that he is creating for the name Israel to endure. The rabbis have been dismissed. By my, by my uh, arriving, reckoned with and dismissed. They don't go into the scroll of remembrance until they teach and straighten Judaism out the way the scripture says it is. Instead of these fallacies, these faulty arguments, these bad commentaries, this lack of reasoning and... Uh, And thought about, about how the Bible's written. It's written for two different sets of people. Antiquity in the Middle Ages and the age of reasoning, of science, of medicine, of information, of the internet. You can't rely on what the sages and rabbis said. And he changes it. He had all those horrible verses about the day of the Lord, this great Armageddon, but that's not what happens. He changes it right at the end. He says, well, now this, you know, for, for, for those who can think of their own and don't have to rely on sages and rabbis of antiquity, for those with reasoning abilities, for those who can make proper commentary and argument for what they want to say, contrary to this teaching that uh, the people of Israel are uh, God's righteous servant of Isaiah 53, Instead of realizing that's the man that's going to be God's representation. He's going to be for righteous servants. And there's lots to do. 
And you have to have a description. Even the sages knew that. The leper scholar. A man who's diseased, but is a scholar. Very learned. Okay. Well, as I mentioned, uh, I've gone through three uh, cancers. <clears throat> the last that was supposed to take my life 20 years ago. Uh, but I'm also a lawyer. I am a scholar. And I'm most definitely a scholar of the prophets. The book of the prophets. Of the Tanakh. I don't deal much with the Torah. God says they've done all you can do with the Torah. <laughs> There's just nothing left. You don't even have to bother with it. I don't have anything to do with the Talmud, except when we need something, like like the verses that lead to the naming of the man of Isaiah 53 as a leper scholar. But uh, i got too many other things to do. Rambam says, Mushiach will study Torah day and night. Uh, no, I'm not. Okay, so in the day of the Lord, it's not to destroy sinners or require their repentance uh, because he forgives everybody. Okay, he also amends the first covenant, the covenant delivered by Moses. That's why it's a new covenant. Basically, it's just an amendment and an addition. That's the sin forgiveness. And here's the amendment. He amends the first covenant, Malachi 3, to be mindful of the teaching of my servant Moses, whom I charged at Oreb with laws and rules for all Israel, rather than strict compliance of the first covenant by, by all the Israelites. In Malachi 3, he, he shows you. Not everybody's going to hate him, even though that's what Jeremiah 31 says. Everybody shall hate me. Well, he, he's granting sin forgiveness. He, that's what you would expect. But we also know the reality is that's not going to happen. That's why there's also a scroll of remembrance. Those who heed and revere him and those who do not. So he's recognizing that despite how uh, the new covenant of sin forgiveness is written. About everybody heeding him and everybody will have Torah on the heart. Basically, you know what that means? Everybody's been some, has a clean slate. Everybody is sin free. But don't fall to the evil inclination. Get back to observant Judaism. I mean, I'm supposed to make the many righteous. Well, they're all righteous. But they got to follow up on it. And they got to keep that slate clean. God knew in modern times of secularism and reliance on science, medicine, technology that his righteous servant might not be recognized, believed, or heeded. Again, 53 has in it, he will shun, despise, and account it plagued. And that's already been going on with me for quite some time. And I'm sure it will continue for quite some time. So he says, though, if I'm not heeded and listen to, when he does come, which basically just means if you don't get my temple built, utter destruction is coming to the land. He says, I'm going to bring utter destruction, but he is his creation. What he means, it's just like raising up armies. He's saying Israel will be destroyed one day. If you don't build this third temple and we don't make a lot of noise with the last prophet of God. The last messenger of God. You know, that's what the Muslims say about Muhammad. They even etch it in stone on their mosque. The last prophet, the last messenger of God. Well, he's not. And that's going to cause some noise too. Because you're looking at the last prophet right here. And what else should you see if you use your imagination? The angel of his presence, the Holy Spirit, has entered me and God is in him. Okay, I think this is number eight of the top ten fallacies of Judaism. God, his angel, spirit, the Gentile Moshe, come from Adam. 
Gentile lands in this day of the Lord. Okay, this is going to explain better than I, <clears throat> uh, the previous uh, seven fallacies how it is Adam is associated with Christianity and Gentile lands. Judaism does not teach that Moshiach comes with God from Gentile lands or that Moshiach is a Gentile. Which you think anti-missionaries would really like to get their hands on. Because if you believe, and you should, that he's a Gentile, well, what do we know? Jesus is a Jew. He can't be the man of Isaiah 53 for many reasons. But that's just another one. It's part of the reason uh, God comes with the Gentiles, as a matter of fact. Because he knew what the Gentiles were going to do. Who is this coming from Adam in crimson garments from Basra? That, that was a, a city kind of like Jerusalem to Adam. That was their capital city. Majestic in attire, pressing forward in his great might, it is I who contend victoriously powerful to give triumph. Okay, that's God. And that's Isaiah chapter 63, verse 1. In the Talmud, Adam is described as the eternal enemy of Israel and Judah, who not only always oppressed Israel, but at the time of the destruction of the first temple, took advantage of the situation and seized control of parts of Judah. And it is hinted that Adam also took part in the destruction of Jerusalem and even in that of the temple itself. The overwhelming majority of homilies about Adam ex speak explicitly of Rome, Gentiles. It was stated that Rome was founded by the children of Asa, brother of Jacob, who was re uh, Jacob, of course, renamed Israel, who were eternal anti antagonists against each other. Asa only married Gentile women. All of his children were Gentiles. The Hebrew word Adam means red. And the Hebrew Bible relates it to the name of its founder, Asa, the elder son of the Hebrew patriarch, Isaac, because he was born, quote, red all over. As a young adult, he sold his birthright to his brother Jacob for red pottage. The Tanakh describes the Edomites as descendants of Asa. These identifications occur in the Midrashim, which that's the plural form of Midrash, and the Talmud, but also in the Palestinian Targums, of the Torah and in the Targums to Lamentations and Esther, Adam became a synonym for Christian Rome and after the fall of Rome to Christianity. The Targums are interpretive renderings of the books of the Hebrew Scriptures, uh, with the exception of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Daniel, uh, into Aramaic. Uh, such versions were needed when Hebrew ceased to be the normal medium of communication amongst the Jews. In synagogue services, the readings of the scriptures was followed by a translation into the Arama Aramaic vernacular of the populace. Uh, and that's from uh, Bruce M. Metzger, a rendering on the Jewish Targums. God says in 63 verse 3, I trod at a vintage, a vintage alone of the peoples, that's the Jewish people, no man was with me. That's how you know he comes with a Gentile. He's got to have his Moses, his visible representation, speaking and writing his words. No man was with me. I trod them down in my anger, trampled them in my rage. Their life blood bespattered my garments, and all my clothing was stained. Okay, picking back up. 
This is a reference to utter destruction to the land of Malachi 3. To the land of Malachi 3. If the purpose of Elijah does not prosper, that's clearing the way for the Lord. Because the Jewish people will not recognize his prophet. The Lord coming from Adam is mentioned by many of the prophets in the Bible. The Lord was not allowed to pass through Adam in the Exodus with Moses. They didn't. They wouldn't let him come through. They had to go around. And the Jewish people. The prophet like Moses with God, as God was with Moses in the Exodus, will come from Adam. The Christian world. Of the Jewish people, none are with God. He comes with a Gentile from the, uh, from the Christian world, from Gentile lands. The nations. Number nine of the top ten fallacies of Judaism. The remnant of 13 tribes returned to Judah. The Talmud talks of, of ten lost tribes. And Judaism teaches that today. There were no lost tribes. All you got to do is <laughs> free Nehemiah and Ezra. They make it clear. That's what the scripture says. The scripture says all 13 tribes. There's 12 tribes who were allotted lands of the promised land. But there's a 13th tribe. And that's the priestly tribe. And uh, they weren't allotted lands. Isaiah 52 is an announcement of prophecy fulfilled. This is 52. And this isn't taught correctly either. A prophecy fulfilled in the return to Jerusalem and Judah of a remnant of all 13 tribes from the Assyria Babylon exile. It's not just Babylon to build a second temple by decree of Cyrus of Persia, who of course was a Gentile, and he was a Moshe, anointed one. He was anointed to build God's temple. And what he did, he said, I'm going to release all the exiles of Assyria and Babylon. And uh, by decree, he told them to go to Jerusalem, if you desire, and rebuild God's house. The tribes of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh that settled outside the Promised Land, east of the River Jordan, and the tribes of the northern kingdom of Samaria, also called uh, Kingdom of Ephraim and Kingdom of Israel, were defeated by the Assyrians and deported, and deported, became exiles to lands in Assyria, northwest of Babylon, which uh, is in Iraq, or would have been, and to the towns of Medea, that's Iran. The Assyrians imported this is very important. They imported Gentiles to the lands of the northern kingdom. That's why when all the tribes came back, they all went to Judah. Gentiles had been imported to the northern kingdom. So they had to go to the southern kingdom. That's why they all went there. That doesn't mean the ten tribes who would make up most of the northern kingdom didn't come back. It's because they couldn't go there. The kingdom of Judah was defeated by the Babylonians and in stages deported to Babylon, again Iraq. Jerusalem is within the lands of Benjamin, which lands are considered part of the kingdom of Judah since that is where the kings of Judah <clears throat> rule from. The accounts of the return of the Jewish people by the decree of Cyrus of Persia, the first Gentile anointed one of God, Hamashiach, who had defeated the Chaldeans. And God mentions the Chaldeans by name. Who had defeated the Babylonians and formed the Persian Empire, including their lands, are in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah and in one chronicles. Hamashiach Cyrus addresses all the 13 tribes in his decree. 
This is in quotes. This is from 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verse 2. Thus said King Cyrus of Persia, The Lord God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and has charged me with building him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Any one of you of all his people, the Lord, his God, be with him and let him go up. Remnants of all the 13 tribes of Israel returned to Jerusalem and Judah. The tribes with allotments uh, in the northern kingdom could not return to those lands. Gentiles who had been imported to the lands of the northern kingdom were settled there, many of whom tried to stop the building of the second temple. This is Ezra, chapter 3, verse 1. When the seventh month arrived, the Israelites, being settled in their towns, the entire people assembled as one man in Jerusalem. The Israelites. Well, if just Judah and Benjamin return, you can't say Israelites because Judah and Benjamin aren't the Israelites and cannot assemble as one man in Israel. They can't. All 13 tribes came back. When the people of Israel gather as one man, it is all 12 tribes and the Levites. The priestly tribe, the Levites is the priestly tribe. But it gets better. 1 Chronicles chapter 9, verse 2 and 3. The first to settle... And basically, the tribes who had been in the northern kingdom, they had to go get land and settle their own homes and towns uh, in Judah. And uh, that would include Benjamin. The first who settled in their towns on their property were Israelites, priests, Levites, and temple servants, while some of the Judaites and some of the Benjamites and some of the Ephraimites and some of the Manassehites settled in Jerusalem. Well, right there, you can't say ten lost tribes. Because it says Manasseh and uh, Ephraim came back. They make it eight. Eight tribes lost. Four came back. But even more importantly is this. Ephraim and Manasseh were not lost tribes, as many believe from writings outside of the Hebrew Bible. It is said in writings by sages and rabbis that ten of the twelve tribes of Israel became lost and did not return to Judah to build the second temple. There never were lost tribes. The other problem with that is we have a false prophecy by Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 43, verses 5 through 6. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your folk from the east, will gather you out of the west. I will say to the north, give back. And to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the end of the earth. This is Isaiah. That's written for the exiles. That's God saying, everybody come back right now. Isaiah prophecies to all the Assyrian Babylon exiles returning by the words of God. The return of the exiles to the land of Israel given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob by covenant and partitioned amongst the twelve. It is not just the Babylon exiles of Judah and Benjamin. It includes all the tribes. In Isaiah chapter 43, God says, verse 14, Thus said the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, For your sake I send to Babylon, I will bring down all her bars. And the Chaldeans, the Chaldeans shall raise their voice in lamentation. The Chaldeans defeated Babylon. The Chaldeans were defeated by Assyria. And Assyria was defeated by Persia. It's not just Babylon exiles of Jews. I'm about to do something new. Even now it shall come to pass. Suddenly you shall perceive it. I will make a road through the wilderness and rivers in the desert. 
It is I, I, who for my own sake wipe your transgressions away and remember them no more. Sin forgiveness. All 13 tribes. There are so many other verses where they gather <clears throat> as one man Israel. As Israelites. Again. That's all 13 tribes. And of course this account in Isaiah is repeated in the book of Jeremiah for the Jewish people of the dispersal of the Roman Jewish revolts who return and the land blooms again and the ruined cities in Jerusalem are rebuilt. God's prophecy of a time to come that also includes sin and forgiveness. So, the time to come with Jeremiah 31 that began in 1948 when the state of Israel was created after the Holocaust. You know, Toby Sanger says uh, the Jewish people as one man as one man were made a guilt offering under, under the laws of Leviticus. But he only uses as his example the six men who were murdered. Murdered in the Holocaust. It's not all the people. I mean, again, his reasoning defies the imagination for such an intelligent man. A man with so much information, but his ability to reason is made brought into sus extreme suspicion. In his analysis of Isaiah 53.10, and as far as I'm concerned, his truthfulness. Because I can't believe he believes these things he's writing. It makes absolutely no sense. He's, all of a sudden he believes God is a God of human sacrifice? I mean, he's acknowledging to the Christians, okay, you're probably right, or you could be right, since our God does accept human sacrifice. But the bottom line is, that's not all the people of Israel. You can't say Isaiah 53 is all of the people assembled as the man of Israel, unless you got all of them. Okay, the final, <clears throat> the final of the ten, top ten fallacies of Judaism. Okay, the Spirit of God aligning upon God's servant David makes him the anointed one. That's what Moshiach means. Anointed one. Ha is, means the, so you can say ha Moshiach, the anointed one. Okay? But it doesn't say anointed to do, to do what? What's he anointed for? God's anointment is not with oil. The anointment is with spirit. When the spirit alights upon you and enters you, that's the anointment, and God is in his spirit. But to do what? Okay, the spirit of God alighting upon the descendant of King David makes him the anointed one, but as I said, to do what? It is to be God's righteous servant. That's where he's described, Isaiah 53. What does he do? He's anointed to make the many righteous. And it includes many other tasks. Because as it turns out, he's four righteous servants. God's righteous servant, Elijah, prophet like Moses, and Moshiach, the descendant of King David. And that, you can find those descriptions in uh, Jeremiah 31, Ezekiel 34 and 37, and Malachi 3. Descriptions of, of, of tasks that he's anointed for. Deliver covenants, clear the way for the Lord. Uh, one of the purposes of Elijah is to bring the Jewish families to or back to Judaism. Being mindful of the teachings of God gave Moses at Oreb of his laws and commandments for all Israel. Which, of course, is the amendment, and there's an inclusion. The new covenant never ended. I mean, the first covenant never ended. It's just an amendment with an addition of sin forgiveness. It's basically a confirmation. Amendment, confirmation, uh, supplementing, 
and of course mindful means not strict compliance. Makes it a little bit easier on those who, who just uh, can't be ultra-Orthodox. They just can't do it. It's just too much. Ultra-Orthodox can take that for what they want. Everybody's going to have to come up with their own, every branch of Judaism. What is meant by mindful? What does that mean? How does that change what we do right now? It's an affirmation and confirmation by declaration of God that he is the God of the Jewish people and the Jewish people are his chosen of all the earth. You know, Judaism doesn't teach you anything on the day of the Lord. It completely conflicts with the Messianic era. They just simply do not go together. And Judaism doesn't teach of the day of the Lord. Um, or, or even, they don't even know that prophets are men and divine beings because they don't recognize the Holy Spirit as a person. As Moshe, as God's righteous servant, as Elijah, as the prophet like Moses, I am a man in divine beings. And this is a, you know, it's, it's, those are all just names. Basically, God has come to me and said, I've got things for you to do. Uh, but i got to whip you into shape. I'm going to put you to fire refinement, my boot camp. I mean, it's great to hear those names. But they don't really mean much other than the fact I'm a man of divine beings. And each of them was too. If you know what you're looking for, you'll find Moses was a man of divine beings. You'll find David was a man of divine beings. You will find Elijah was a man of divine beings. It's there. Once you know what to look for, you can find it. And of course, I point them out in the book. That's all great names aside. Nothing gets done if you're not a man of divine beings because no man can do these things that, quote, Moshiach's supposed to do. Much less God's righteous servant, Elijah, prophet like Moses. I mean, I can't write God's words if he doesn't tell me what to write down. You say, well, how could Judaism not know all these things? God didn't want you to know. It's my proof. It's my proof. Uh, so there's three persons with this, within this human body. But guess who's in control of the show? It's not key. And it's not even the Holy Spirit. It's God. He can control my thoughts, my words, my physical movement. And he does. And he can speak to me if he wants to. And he, I can only say those things that he would want me to say. And in the manner he would want me to say it. What kind of emotion to show? He controls emotions. He said, I created emotion, Keith, and he's proven it to me. I mean, you can be in the greatest mood in the world, and in an instant, you can be in a deep depression. You can be in a deep grief over losing a loved one. He showed me more than one time. And it's fearsome. It's fearsome. It's not, it's not something that's easy to go through by any stretch of the imagination. But it does change you. I am not the man I was when we started. And if you read the book, The Life of God's Righteous Servant, you can see it. You can see what my life was until I was age 50. And then see what it's like right now. And who I am now. It's very interesting. And as I said, if you're not a man in divine beings, it's the only way any man could perform the task of the four righteous servants. It's the only way. Great names, fun to say it. I'm David. I'm Elijah. I'm Prophet like Moses. I'm God's righteous servant. The important one is, I'm a man in divine beings. And God's been doing it, and he did it throughout the Hebrew Bible. His spirit alights upon you. He enters you. And then you can hear God speak because God is in his spirit. Well, that's the top ten. That's not all of them, by the way. That's just the top ten. 
I bet I could come up with another 10. But in any event, if the rabbis want to remove themselves from dismissal, have themselves entered into the scroll of remembrance, see the heaven God is creating, and by the way, he's taking me there in vision dozens of times. And I promise you, you do not want to miss it. I promise you. It is something else. They're going to have to teach the manners of those two books. They're on the internet, WordPress site, Keith McCarty, McCarty.wordpress.com. Uh, and, and I do every single chapter of both books uh, on YouTube. So, you can, re you know, you get more out of it if you read it, because you can think more than just listen to me, just go, 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 and talk, talk, talk. But every time you see me, I'm reading from those books. I'm reading from those books. Thank you very much for listening.